Hi, I'm Chris and I'm sure you have all met John. My twin brother and I had the misfortune to be born with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a progressive genetic muscle wasting disease. We never let this stop us. We ran a website development business, from 2001, until we got sick of dealing with customers, in 2010. <laughs> website development did have one bonus, that's how we met John. Over the years my brother Nick and I have designed everything from doorknobs, drones, CNC machines and robots. In 2014 I started Melbourne Eastern Suburbs Hackers Inc., a makerspace based in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. A few years ago my brother Nick and I employed John to help us to build our various projects, mostly Nick's. John doesn't consider this work, he's the sort of weirdo that designs circuits for fun. Great, thanks Chris. <laughs> yes, I am that sort of weirdo. Uh, and I do love doing this stuff, but there is a much more important reason for it. I think these projects are incredibly important. They are the sort of project that you don't just do because you love it, but you can do it because they can change people's lives. And uh, there are uh, many, many reasons for that. Uh, how many people were at my talk last year about um, assistive technology? Great, okay. So I finished that talk with um, discussing some of the challenges of the cost of this sort of equipment. If you're at that talk, you're not allowed to answer this question. This is just to set the scene for those who weren't there. This is the dealer price list from a wheelchair manufacturer for accessories to go on a wheelchair. And this is the dealer pricing before it actually gets marked up and then sold to the end customer. Now what you can see there, this is an item that uh, my eyes just sat there gobsmacked when I saw this. What it says is joystick knob foam ball 42 millimeter diameter black. And that's because joysticks need to be tuned to suit the individual user, so they have different types of fittings on them. One of the fittings you can select is a foam ball. You might be overthinking it and thinking that's a very complicated foam ball, but it's not. It's literally a 42 millimeter foam ball. Any guesses as to how much the dealer price on this little foam ball is? Someone throw a number at me. 50 bucks? 50 bucks? Well, yeah. That's US dollars dealer price before the markup for a little ball of foam. So the cost of assistive technology is just ridiculous. There was a comment in the last talk, uh, someone said it costs a lot of money to be disabled and that's absolutely true. Um, there are many other uh, issues as well. For example, one of the reasons that this costs so much is the amount of regulation that's involved, the lack of competition and the, well to be honest, the lack of innovation that happens as a result of all of that regulation. There are only two companies in the world that make uh, high quality wheelchairs that are sold into the Western market and they're both extremely expensive. The chair Chris is sitting in, for example, cost over $42,000. Now that is largely because of uh, regulation and the time it takes to bring these things to market. Uh, and in China, for example, where there's far less regulation, there has been an e-bike boom which has led to easy availability of technology like battery packs, motor controllers, very high power motors. And so in China, they have leapfrogged uh, our technology in terms of wheelchairs. And it's very common now for wheelchairs to have LiPo batteries and brushless DC motors with electronic speed controllers. It's just generally much more modern technology. So the, there was a combination of all of these reasons that led to, uh, to me working with Nick and Chris on our first project together. So Chris, how about you explain that a little bit? Our first project with John was inspired by the discovery that one of the largest wheelchair manufacturers in the world had stopped making an essential product. For all this to make sense we need to go back several years when Nick and Chris inherited two 24 volt wheelchair hand heaters. Some people with neuromuscular diseases such as muscular dystrophy are greatly affected by cold weather. Our hands would get cold and we would no longer be able to drive our wheelchairs, even air conditioning could do this to us. And this is a common problem for many people in wheelchairs. Getting these heaters changed our lives, but we knew those heaters wouldn't last forever. 
And what about all those people who didn't have hand heaters at all? Also the ones they just stopped making were very expensive, $300 when they used less than $30 worth of parts, a very reasonable 1000% markup, not including installation, which was probably another $1000 on top of that. The answer was to start making our own heaters. Our stepdad, Pete, helped us build the first prototype which I used on my desk for six months. None of these projects could have been done without Pete's help. Midway through this project we also started working with John to help with the electronics. Working together, the four of us have done a few different versions of the heater. Me and John aren't the most efficient team. We have lots in common, and are always distracting each other. Like the time I designed an RC aircraft, and wanted to fly the plane myself using my wheelchair's joystick, a project John named the Chair Breakout Mini, or CB Mini. The latest heater and Chair Breakout Mini both have the option to use Combust John imagining some future where they would all be mounted permanently on an electric wheelchair. That turned out to be a good idea when John came up with our latest distraction, LCA. Sadly, in late 2018 Nick passed away. Since then John and I have continued some of Nick's projects, and come up with some new ones of our own. So most of the projects that we're going to talk about today are based on a very simple building block, which is the Arduino Leonardo. And if you come from a software background, it can seem really daunting getting into messing around with hardware and trying to build your own devices. And the Arduino Leonardo is interesting because it has a combination of characteristics. It has the ability to emulate a human interface device, so it can pretend to be a joystick or a keyboard or a game controller. And there is example code in the Arduino IDE. So if you want to build your own custom input device, basically all you need is the Arduino IDE examples, um, the Arduino Leonardo, and something like a jumper wire or a button. So basically for the cost of like a large skinny latte at the, com at the combi, you can have everything you need and get started. So if you're coming at this purely from a software point of view, it's a really easy entry point. Now we've made the, the deliberate decision to stick with this processor, even though there are so many others that we could be using. Um, there are lots of options, but the, one of the advantages of this is that we really want to make these projects accessible to people who don't necessarily come from a technical background. They might know someone that can help them a little bit, and being able to just plug in USB and a couple of switches um, gets you a very long way if you start with these as building blocks. So one of the first Arduino projects that Nick and Chris did is the button box, and this I think was the very first prototype. It's some micro switches inside a box with uh, 35 millimeter connectors, which just connect into an Arduino Leonardo. And what you can do is by activating any of those switches, the Leonardo will send an event to a computer. It could be a, key, a sequence of keystrokes or it could be a mouse event. So with a really simple start like this, you can build a device that can be used by someone with limited physical mobility to activate really complex events on the computer. Uh, so Nick then designed a 3D printed version that used uh, levers to give more, um, or make it easier to apply force onto the micro switches. And you can see here the version that uh, Chris uses on his computer. So what he has is a combination of a gaming mouse in his right hand and the button box in the left hand. And by using that combination of the pointer and then um, keyboard events from the left hand, he can fly through software like Fusion 360 to design things faster than I can even follow what he's doing. The really critical part of this is that there is a convention for um, assistive technology buttons, or this, this approach is called AT buttons, and it, it, everything basically uses 3.5 mil connectors. So what you can do is make different types of buttons. They could be foot switches, or it could be um, large buttons for people with limited dexterity, or it could even be something like a sip and puff interface or a chin control system. As long as it can provide a switched output with a 3.5 millimeter connection, you could connect that to something like an Arduino Leonardo and use it to control a computer in all sorts of creative ways. Um, this has become such a standard way of doing it that even Microsoft makes hardware related to this now. So Chris, do you want to tell us about that? 
In September 2018 Microsoft released the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which uses those same 3.5mm jacks as inputs. As soon as Nick heard about it, he bought one. They were $99 US. It had only taken Microsoft 10 years to catch up to us. We thought $99 was a bit much so John started designing the Mini Open Adaptive Controller. It's much smaller and a hell of a lot cheaper, it doesn't have controls built in and only has 8 button ports, but it's just perfect for the majority of PC computer games and retro games. And there's no reason why you couldn't plug 2 or 3 into the same computer. Another huge advantage of our open source version is that it can be adapted to work with any sort of software. The Xbox Adaptive Controller works like a game controller, so you have to use it with software that works with a game controller. With the Open Adaptive Controller we can do HID emulation and pretend to be a keyboard, mouse, joystick, game controller, or a Frankensteinian combination of all three. We can also have simple buttons trigger complex events. Yeah, so the, um, the, the idea with this, and it looks like a, a fairly unusual sort of device, but at its core, that's really just an Arduino Leonardo. So what you can do is go down and, and buy a regular off-the-shelf Leonardo. You can run the software on it that we've developed for this and build this sort of thing yourself. The barrier to entry to getting started with this is incredibly small. And um, the designs for all of this are up on GitHub. So um, the assistive technology buttons that we've been showing so far are mechanical, so they require physical force to operate. Uh, but that can be difficult for some people. So there is an alternative. Um, Chris? Many forms of muscular dystrophy feature gradual weakening of the muscles, that's why my wheelchair has two capacitive touch switches to turn it on and change modes. These switches are a perfect example of very poor quality products for the disabled. They happen to come with small batteries that run out every few months. You get no warning, it just mysteriously stops working. And unfortunately it is not a straightforward operation to change them, it requires a screwdriver. How we discovered it even has batteries is that it stopped working, so we pulled it apart to see what had gone wrong. How many call-outs are there for wheelchair repairs just to change a stupid battery? In many cases the repairman has to be called because carers aren't allowed to start undoing screws even if they know what they are doing. Of course I don't have to worry about stupid bureaucracy, because I employ my own carers, but many don't have that luxury. So we decided to make our own touch switch called Touch Switch 1. As with many of our projects, it isn't quite finished. <laughs> yes, yeah, still not. I know, I showed part of this um, last year at LCA. Uh, we went through the process of working out the circuit for the touch switch. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this today because this one got shoved aside a little bit in favour of some other things we wanted to work on. But rather than a $500 touch switch, we wanted to replicate that functionality with a few dollars worth of parts. The, uh, one of the issues that we ran into is that tuning touch switches can be quite tricky. So we've got it working, but it's affected by things around it, um, the metal structure of the chair. So. Uh, some other things came up and we had another idea about a different way that we could make a switch that would be almost as usable as a touch switch and it actually has um, different types of advantages. So this all came about because when Chris is sleeping he has an assistive technology button on a Velcro strap around his hand so that while he's lying in bed if he needs assistance he can squeeze that button and call for help. It's uh, basically a, like a nurse call system. And the force required to activate that button is starting to become a little bit difficult. So we started looking at how we can do things like use load cells to measure the pressure that Chris is applying. And we started on this project called Super Button. And um, what we did was take a, uh, a very accurate load cell. So this, well, not necessarily accurate, very sensitive. It's 300 gram full scale, so we can measure down to a tenth of a gram quite easily. And made up a little structure for it. Once again, we hacked it up, connected it to an Arduino, 
And um, you can see just inside the top left of the white section, there's a little silver cylinder. That is a vibration motor, which is usually used for vibration in mobile phones. So it's set up with haptic feedback so that as you squeeze it, it'll tell you when the button has been activated. But the really cool thing about this is that there is no mechanical activation required. What you're doing is applying force to the load cell, which is then uh, being measured, and we can set the threshold. So with the, uh, the system we've got at the moment, you can see the number on the left is the force that's currently being applied to the button. The number on the right is the threshold. So to tune this for different people, you don't have to do any mechanical changes. All you do is click the button to put it into set mode, turn the number, and click it again, and it saves it in non-volatile memory. So what you can do is have this mounted at the head of the bed and then adjust the threshold to suit the, um, the needs of whoever is using it. So, and the sensitivity is, is excellent. So it means that someone with very little strength can activate this and they get the feedback from the vibration in the button so they know when it's been activated. And by combining that, because all of this stuff just plugs together with um, 3.5 mil jacks, what we can do is combine the super button with the open adaptive controller and use uh, force threshold to trigger sending events to a computer. So this is just one of the inputs that you can use into something like an adaptive controller. Now, about a, um, a week before coming to LCA, I did a really stupid thing and started a new project. I got distracted by load cells and I decided that I would try making a, um, a stiff stick or a zero deflection joystick. And uh, I spent a bit of time on this until Chris told me to stop and to get back to the projects we should be working on. But this is something I'm really excited about. With a normal joystick, the way it works is that there is a mechanism that provides resistance to return it to center, but the joystick itself is measuring the amount of deflection. And for people with a limited range of mobility and uh, limited strength, it's often not possible to move the joystick or the resolution is very low because what you're measuring is an extremely small range of motion of the physical structure. So with the stiff stick, what it does is the central part of the joystick doesn't need to move. It's measuring the force that's being applied in different directions. Uh, what's a bit hard to see in that picture is that the center structure is actually mounted on a spring and it's directly contacting the load cells. So there's nothing to stop the center structure moving except the load cells themselves. And that makes an, an extremely sensitive joystick. So what we could do is use this in place of something like the Hall Effect joystick on Chris's chair so that he can have very uh, fine control of the chair or whatever it is that he wants to do on the computer. One of the problems with the Hall Effect joysticks at the moment is that when it's put into Bluetooth mode and linked to Chris's phone or the computer, the resolution is quite poor. So it makes it hard for him to move and, uh, on screen and use something like a soft keyboard. So after Chris got mad at me and <laughs> I stopped working on that, I put it aside, I'll get back to it. Um, we went back to um, another project that I started talking about last year. And this is the chair breakout mini that Chris mentioned earlier. Um, it started out as a bit of a hack to try to reverse engineer the control system on the existing wheelchair and figure out how we could use the wheelchair's controls ourselves and also how we could take control of the chair. And as I showed last year, it went through a few iterations and we ended up with a device that can connect in line with the joystick on the chair. It provides us USB output so that what we can do is use the chair's controls to emulate a, um, a human interface device connected to a computer. And then that can be used for um, doing things like playing games using the wheelchair controls. So what you can see here is Chris's brother Nick using the, adapt, uh, using the, um, the chair breakout and his joystick to proportionally control the steering and the throttle in this driving simulator. And of course, we can take it to the, the semi-real thing. We also linked it up to a radio transmitter. And in this one, there's an even earlier prototype linked to the FlySky transmitter, which is sending commands to the remote control car. So in this case, the wheelchair controls are being redirected to control the car. Now, what we found with this was we were hoping that we would be able to use this as a way of 
retrofitting devices into the existing control system of the chair and then being able to take control of it and make it do things that we wanted. But we found that there were some really major limitations. So we ended up changing our plan. Instead of simply patching into the existing chair, we decided that we would go rather more drastic and rip out all existing control system and build our own. So Chris, tell us about that. One of my brother's last projects was to design an open source electric wheelchair. We didn't have enough time to build a whole wheelchair, maybe next year, so we thought we'd concentrate on the wheelchair electronics. We used my brother's old wheelchair as a test bed. John dubbed it the super chair. He's really good at naming things. The electronics would be open source, able to be controlled with a variety of devices, have an arbitrary number of buttons, joysticks and eventually voice control or maybe a self-driving function. It will also be able to drive any DC electric motor and an arbitrary number of actuators. It will be able to act as a Bluetooth human interface device, mouse, keyboard or game controller. It would need to be easy to use and set up. Have a straightforward API to allow people to extend the system, adding things like robot arms, nurse call systems, Wi-Fi. Even an inbuilt computer that can run apps to interface with home automation systems. Using a button and joystick to navigate a menu to control chair functions, or having a single button for each function when the user is unwilling or unable to use a menu. The chair must be able to integrate with other accessible technologies. Setting up the wheelchair should be as simple and accessible as possible, not needing any special equipment to do so, while also giving advanced users advanced options including a well-documented API. I'm thinking, a web-based interface due to the ubiquity of web browsers. It needs to be easy to add custom modules. All hardware and software on the chair should be off the shelf, such as the use of CAN, bus, throughout an Arduino compatible microcontrollers. Yeah, so what you can see on the controller there, the two connectors on the left are CAN bus connectors. Once again, the main controller for this is just an ATmega32U4, same as in an Arduino Leonardo. This particular part of the chair control system doesn't really have to do very much. This is and we deliberately want to keep it as simple as possible because this is the part that directly drives the motors and of course that's where all the danger is. So it's got a, um, a high powered motor driver uh, and you can see on the bottom there are five connectors. The big one in the middle is the power that comes in from the chair battery. The larger ones just beside it are outputs to the two motors and then the ones on the outside of that are two brake solenoids. Uh, because when a, um, a chair is stationary or nearly stationary, the motors don't provide much braking. It does regenerative braking when the chair is slowing down and it's moving quickly. But if you stop on a slope, the chair can start to roll. So the way these are set up is that they have solenoid brakes built into the, um, the motor mechanism. And to make the chair move, you have to fire the solenoids. So if there's no power, the chair is locked in place and it won't move. So those two outer connectors go to the brakes and what the controller does is um, it knows when the chair is stationary. So as you approach being stationary and then you stop, it removes power from the solenoids, the brakes apply and the chair just locks in place and it disengages the brakes when the chair needs to move. So what we've done is uh, try to make just the functionality required for moving the chair in that particular controller um, at the moment, we are actually hitting the current limit of around 55 to 60 amps per motor um, running through this, and we're probably going to have to upgrade to a higher power um, motor driver module. But at the moment, this is certainly enough for us to get the chair around. And because it's connected by a CAN bus, um, we can link it through to another little device. Um, this is the, the test chair down here. You can, just on the back of it, near the big red emergency <coughs> panic stop button, there is a Raspberry Pi with a board on it which provides a CAN bus interface and that links then down into the motor controller. So we can use the Raspberry Pi to provide high level control of the chair and then give it instructions like I want you to move in this direction or turn to the right. And um, so what we can do is hopefully not have too much demo fail here. I probably will. 
I'll exit out of this because I think I've lost my connection to the chair in the meantime. Yes, I have. But Okay, so what you can see here is a little Python script which is running on the Raspberry Pi. And I've got an emergency stop button on here. But what it's going to do is send CAN bus uh, messages based on the position of the joystick on the PlayStation controller down to the motor controller. So from here, and you'll hear the clicking as well as the chair starts and stops. That clicking is the brakes being uh, released or engaged. So just as the chair starts to move, it clicks, and that's when the brakes release. So we now have control over the physical movement of the chair using entirely our own electronics. We're not relying on any of the existing system here. What we're doing is connecting into the battery pack and we're sending power to the motors and the brakes. Everything else on this chair is disconnected. We can quickly revert it to factory just by plugging the original connectors in. Uh, but at the moment, we, we have 100% control over the motion of the chair using the systems that we've built. So that is, um, that's a pretty big step forward. It means that it gives us lots of flexibility now that we can layer other things on top of this and make this behave in different ways. Because of course the, the ultimate objective is, as Chris said, to add other actuators. We might want to add some self-driving capability, um, collision avoidance. One of the issues with, um, with moving around in a chair is knocking into objects on the back. As with these front drive chairs, they rotate around the center of the drive wheels, which is right at the front of the chair. And that means that if you spin on the spot, you're not moving around the center of mass of the chair, you're moving around the front of the chair, which means the back can knock into things. Now, that sounds like a, um, that sounds really bad, but these chairs are actually extremely agile. Um, the front drive chairs allow you to get into tighter spots than uh, the mid drive chairs can do. And, um, what we can do is maybe add some, uh, some LiDAR and maybe a bit of dingo car or something like that onto it. The ultimate objective with this is to be able to take information about the environment and either combine that with the control signals that are being sent by uh, the person using the chair or make it totally hands off and give it high level commands. For example, take me to the kitchen. Instead of having to drive the chair manually and navigate through the house, simply have it take you to the destination so that you don't have to um, manually avoid bumping into things. So while we've been working on this particular part of it, there are a couple of guys in Canada who have been working on uh, voice control. And uh, this is a really interesting little project. So I'll jump out of the chair. So on the right, this is Daniel Coe, who also has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, a couple of years ago, he had a tracheotomy, and uh, that meant that he could no longer use voice assistants like um, Google to be able to control things in his environment. His house had been set up to use Google Home, so he had a lot of control. But the problem is that after the tracheotomy, he can't say three syllables in a single block. He can only say up to two syllables at a time because of the breathing cycle required. And that meant that he could no longer say, OK, Google. And he couldn't activate um, his home automation system. Now, his brother, Michael, who you see there on the left, is an engineering and physics student at University of British Columbia and has been working with his brother to help him regain control of his chair and other things around the house as well. Now, the structure that you can see just between them, the, um, the white, black, and blue structure, is a mechanism that they have built to take control of the chair. They've got the same basic problem that we had. They're trying to save, solve the same problem, but they're going about it in a totally different way, which is really interesting. Now, because uh, Michael's background is in software, instead of trying to uh, rewire the chair, what he's done is built a structure that uses servos to physically manipulate the joystick on the chair. Then he can send commands to it, and it moves the joystick just as if Daniel was doing it manually. So what, they, he, what he did then is set up a, um, a TensorFlow-based um, system, so a machine learning system, and he trained it on a number of very short words that Daniel can say. 
Now, one of their favorite movies is Wall-E. So they used Ava as the, um, the activation word for their speech recognition system. So this is one of the very first tests that Daniel did driving the chair uh, by using uh, voice control, which then is recognized using TensorFlow, and then the command is sent to the joystick on the chair. Ava, L. Ava, S. Let's try turning to the right. Ava, R. Nice. Ava S. <laughs> nice. We did it. So that's a huge achievement for them to have, to have got to this point. Um, for probably the last year or two, um, Daniel has been unable to move unassisted. So this has given him back a lot of freedom that he didn't have before. Now, all around the world, there are many smart people like this working on different aspects of these problems. And we all have little pieces of the solution or different approaches to it. And uh, it's really by working together that we can build systems that are more complete. Now, for a few months now, um, Chris and I have been talking to Michael and Daniel, and um, we've been telling them about the stuff that we've been working on, and they've been showing us their work as well. And um, what we're working towards is collaborating on a system where we can use um, Michael's software expertise combined with some of the electronics that we are working on. Um, we will probably end up sending them over some hardware that they can experiment with and we'll try running their software. But by working together, we can hopefully build a system that combines the, um, the electrical control that we've achieved with the software control that they've achieved. And it's really by working together that um, uh, that we can build systems that are going to help far more people and not just work in isolation. And uh, there is an awful lot that you can do to help too. Uh, Chris? How the open source community can help. Think about all users of your device, program or game. Don't inadvertently exclude people by your design decisions. Like making sure a Bluetooth mouse can be used on your iOS or Android app. Designing open source devices that make life easier for people with disabilities. Or improving poor quality devices that already exist. Use off-the-shelf open source technologies that make it easy to interface with other systems. Make a complete API that is language agnostic and cross-platform. Many of these are good ideas regardless. Join our Discord and support us on Patreon. Help us with our projects. Almost all our projects are on GitHub and I'm always willing to share a project on Fusion 360. Thanks for listening. So, thank you. So we have 10 minutes for questions. So if you want to ask a question, please come to the microphone. Front. Or $10 a ride and you can jump in the chair. <laughs> I got a question for John. <laughs> Jumping the queue. How do I change the voice on my phone? <laughs> I don't know. I think it suits you. I want to ask about the power budget that you've got for strapping on things like GPUs onto the, the chair to have them portable with you. How do you go for battery packs then? Yep, that's a great question. So um, I've worked on some very low power projects in the past. Uh, for example, working on um, satellite subsystems, which 
we have a power budget that really, really matters down to the milliamp. Uh, luckily for this, we've got huge batteries sitting in the bottom of this. The motors on the chair, um, well, at the moment we're limiting them to 60 amps per motor, so 120 amps total through the controller, and that's not even close to what the chair can pull, and it'll drive around for hours. Uh, so the power budget that we've got available is crazy compared to anything else I've ever worked on. You mentioned a couple times that a lot of these devices use 3.5 millimeter inputs. I know a lot of other external medical hardware also uses 3.5 mil. Have you run into any unique problems as tablets, smartphones, and laptops are increasingly getting rid of this interface? Yes. Um, so not necessarily in terms of getting rid of the 3.5 mil interface, because what we are doing is not using it. It's the same connector as a headphone jack but it's not being used as an audio connection. It's being used as a simple switched contact. Um, but one of the issues that, uh, that Chris has faced is touch interfaces on phones that are not designed to work with something like a Bluetooth mouse. Uh, so, so many um, interfaces now are designed totally with a touch-centric concept. So things like touch the screen and drag in order to be able to scroll a page. So if Chris has a document open on his phone and he wants to be able to scroll down, that can be really hard using the joystick in Bluetooth mode because um, keyboards and uh, Bluetooth keyboards and mice just aren't really supported very well by mobile interfaces. So the move towards mobile devices is a problem in that respect. And that would be largely overcome if the interfaces for them were designed so that you could um, use a Bluetooth mouse. If you could use a Bluetooth mouse with a phone, it would be fine. That would mean that Chris would be able to access all the functions that he needs. Uh, but in terms of getting rid of headphones, jacks, and things like that, that, um, that isn't a problem. Last year, you touched on the regulatory problems with making things like those heater boxes accessible. Um, yes. Have you, can you comment on how that works with some of the newer things that you discussed today? Yeah. Um, so the, the big issue is the amount of regulation around anything to do with medical devices and the problem of selling things. Now, the, um, there are some crazy regulations. If you, a, a wheelchair is considered a medical device, which means it needs to be certified and um, approved for sale in Australia, at least. And the, um, the interesting side effect of that is that if you have a medical device and you modify it, anything that you attach to that medical device also has to be certified, which means if you want to put a mobile phone ho holder on a wheelchair, it has to be a medically certified mobile phone holder, which is insane. So a lot of these regulations are not really in alignment with reality and the way that people use things. The difficulty that we face is taking some of these projects through and turning them into commercial projects or products that are just going to be sold to anyone that wants to buy them over the counter. Now doing that is, uh, it's similar to developing anything and selling it as a product. It's got to be um, you know, as approved for sale with, under the electrical standards and emissions and all of those things, but medical regulation adds a whole lot of complication on top of that. So what we've been doing so far is focusing on building building blocks, not complete products. And this really aligns very well both with the open source ethos of take something as a starting point and then tune it to your own devices, your own purposes, and the problems faced by people with physical disabilities because every, um, every issue or every problem you want to solve is different in some way. You can't necessarily say this is a product that is going to solve the problem for everyone. And by creating building blocks and then letting people use those building blocks as they want to, uh, it means that we're not supplying complete products. We're supplying things that other people are using to solve their own problems. Uh, yeah, did you guys work on the button interface yourself, or is that using an existing software? Uh, which button interface is that? Uh, with his fingers that presses buttons. Oh, yeah. Um, Nick and Chris designed all of that, and Peter built the, um, uh, built the mechanical structure. Oh. So the, um, you're talking about the one with the little fingers where... Yeah, but I mean the software of it is that... Oh, the software. Okay. So... If you want to build something like that, when you first look at it, you might think, that's really complicated, I couldn't do that. 
but the reality is that the code that runs that is a very lightly modified example that comes with the Arduino IDE. So in the IDE, it comes with some USB examples, including emulating a keyboard and sending key events, like sending a letter, for example, is activated by a switch connected to one of the inputs. So really all it is, is an Arduino Leonardo board with switches connected to it. Electrically, it couldn't get any simpler. And from a software point of view, it's taking the example, changing a couple of values, and that's it. So the, um, the mechanical structure with the 3D printed structure, which is really cleverly made to suit the specific um, hand requirements, is uh, like that's another step beyond it. But if you wanted to make something that was functionally the same as that, you could do it using the examples in the IDE. Um, I was going to comment that um, if you've tried um, sort of like a coding keyboard, like combinations where you can use, say, two fingers at the same time to get extra functionality, and there's, yes, yeah, things you could do like that. No, we haven't tried that. What we have done is combine different functionality into different keys. So one of the issues is the force required to activate the keys. Um, now, we, earlier I showed you the, the super button, which is the force activated button. One of the things that we're planning to do, and we were hoping to get done before LCA, was make a version of that button box with load cells in it. And what that would make it much easier to do is tune the activation force of each switch. <clears throat> At the moment, it would be difficult for Chris to activate a very specific combination of keys at the same time with the right latency <clears throat> to not activate the wrong thing. Okay. <clears throat> but by being able to tune it using those load cells, we might be able to do that. Okay. Um, another comment, um, Chris, if you want, I can probably help change your voice. <laughs> <laughs> No, don't tell him how. <laughs> so using uh, C++ on Arduinos right now, have you th th thought about uh, making the system a little more accessible by using MicroPython or CircuitPython or something like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, using MicroPython or SNCC. <laughs> uh, MicroPython is definitely the right target here. It yeah. Require uh, an ARM processor instead of your little at megas, but yeah. the more expensive at least. Mm -hmm. And they are standard Arduino, Arduino chips, so. Yes, that's true. So there are, there are other, um, other ways you can go about this. Um, we really just followed the, the lowest common denominator, I suppose, which is the cheap Arduino with the off-the-shelf examples. Um, but there are definitely other ways to do it. And if, for people who are more comfortable with Python, uh, using an alternative hardware platform might make it easier for them to deal with the software side of things. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Question for me, guys. Uh, just wondering about the practicalities of using maker machines such as CNCs, 3D printers. Uh, Chris, do you use those directly, and how, how does that work with you and your carers and you know, operating those? Well, Chris is a um, <laughs> he's a 3D design guru. He's um, he's incredible with Vision 360. <clears throat> so, what he can do is take the design through to uh, the CAM stage. And then uh, Peter is an expert at CNC machining and running the laser cutter and all of those sorts of things. So he can take the designs and then turn it into physical reality. Um, also, his carers are amazing. Um, they, because both Nick and Chris have all their lives built things, whenever they've wanted something to be done, their carers have helped with building model aircraft or putting things in the laser cutter and running tools. So they deserve a huge amount of credit as well. <laughs> yeah, stand up. <laughs> this is Jasmine and Elise. I think we are all out of time. I can certainly attest to the carers. I've watched you guys, ladies, this week and all the things you do. That's amazing. So thank you so much, um, John and Chris. I have some gifts here. And I do realize a notebook, giving a notebook to Chris is a bit weird. So I've got an extra little gift for Chris there on the bottom. There's a kit from me. So I'll just pass those to you, John. OK. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. There you go, Chris.